All right, we'll just do it this way then, because then I know everyone can see this. Cool. Thank you for telling me. All right, so quick stuff. You won't see the transitions, but we'll live with it. Um, you know, we're just popping bullet points anyway. So hi, most people know me as Agilis or Agilis, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, I'm old. I've been playing visual novels since like 2002. I've been translating visual novels since like 2005, mostly working stage and island and stuff. I became more active in the industry, like actually doing like some for hire work or just talking to industry people in 2009. And then I started working at Sekai Project as a project manager starting 2014. Now though all this is only relevant in the sense that I, it, I'm just saying that I've been around watching the industry kind of form for a good decade now. And that's where I'm coming from that perspective. Um, it doesn't mean that I am right in most things. Um, right now I'm going to be, for this entire presentation, I'll be talking about vision novels as an industry. So I'm going to be looking at it macro level. There will be, I will not, talk about individual brands. I will not be talking about individual titles. I will only be talking like in the aggregate. So there will be, and I will be, there is a very blurred line between industry and the indies, the doujin scene, because it's all part of the same creative ecosystem. So I'm pretty much going to gloss over all these little minor differences. So as a disclaimer, I, you know, to keep things sh short, I will be talking in extremely broad strokes. There will be white lies, hand waving, all sorts of exceptions everywhere. So you know, I will say something, and it's not—it's going to be like eighty percent correct, right? Uh, and um, otherwise, we're just going to go down a rabbit hole. So uh, before we get into like the history, so that we can see the arc and development of the industry, like the main, like some key features of the industry is that. There is a relatively low barrier to entry compared to almost any other video game genre. Right? There's very low development costs. You can like you know you can always pay more, but the bare minimum is really low. Like with you know a couple hundred dollars, you can probably get something off the ground. There's relatively low in skill requirements, right? You only need a basic engine, text, graphics, and a little bit of music, right? And you don't need to know how to do 3D rendering. You don't need to have to do you know, complex game logic programming and all that stuff. So it's very easy to do. Uh, it also is a very flexible medium, which because it's so cheap and easy and the format's fairly simple, you can do, it leads to all sorts of different styles and subgenres. And it, um, you know, it competes with all sorts of entertainment, like mostly otaku things, it, but uh, this is important because it, it's competing against computer games, video games, mobile games, anime, manga, all sorts of things, and you know, it's all stuff that competes for people's attention. And that situation has changed quite a bit in the past you know, 10, 15 years, um, and so it becomes relevant over time. So we're going to start you know, going into the, the white lies now, right? talking about the history of Yen novels. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, for the past 15 years, a lot of the story about the Western industry is chasing up to Japan. My feel is that it's actually, that story has come to a close, uh, and we'll get into that. But um, throughout the entire history, it doesn't really matter where you're looking in Japan, here, or otherwise, visual novels has actually been a very niche product, right? There's been a handful of breakout successes, mostly Type Moon and a couple other things, but in general, even in Japan, it has still been like a subsection of like an anime, um, like otaku kind of thing. And the popularity has always has grown and waned over time. But you know, we're still talking about a niche thing. So, you know, going into the late '90s, right? Pretty much like in Japan, the modern VN format is, is like starts solidifying, right? We get like the first really gigantic hits like, you know, Sakura Taisen, Kanan, Kanemoto, like Too Hard, like these these games have started out. Uh, like the, the genre itself was been like forming since like the 80s, right? And, but like these were the starts where, where a lot of people started taking notice of them. Um, you know, some animations have been like, mainstream animations have come out of these and been, you know, seen success. Um, so that's the late 90s, right? In the early 2000s, like the most famous brands that we know today have pretty much become established, right? Like Key, Leaf, Type Moon, they all got their start in the late 90s doing their stuff, but like they became like the pillars of the world that we know it now at around that time. In the West now, there are a bunch of small brands. Most of them are all gone now. 
think all of them are all gone now, that were localizing niche titles, like mostly Arrow. If you like look in VNDB, you can actually see some stuff going on about, oh, you know, this game, this so-and-so game has come up, um, but, you know, they're all gone now. All the brands are gone now, but they were not that good. They, like, like, obviously, kind of, like, key games were never, had never been released, like, in that era. A lot of the high-quality games weren't. It was just, like, they licensed whatever they could at that time. There were some fan interests coming out of the anime fandom, like, you know, after seeing a lot, like, after seeing the canon anime, a bunch of people got interested in this whole visual novel thing, and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, still, it was fairly unknown in that time. And then in the late, like, the mid to late 2000s, I, like, I call this, like, the golden age of Japan. Like, that's when we saw, like, some of the best games that, um, and the most famous games, Clonade, Fate, the Love series um, came out around that time. Sengoku Rants came out. Like a lot of the, the defining, like canon of titles came out at around that time. Uh, in the West, there was increasingly a growing fan interest. There were a lot of fan translation products. That's when I got involved in that scene, um, where projects started popping up quite a bit, and there were more localization companies. I remember a couple of new brands coming up. Manga Gamer came up in around this time, give or take. Um, there, the actual creation of amateur like Western VNs did sort of pop up, but it, all that was kind of minor, and I'm not very familiar with it, but I knew it was kind of happening, but like nothing like actually rose to the forefront <clears throat> of attention outside of there. And then things went bad. Uh, the 2007-2008 financial crisis happened. Um, that, like, totally changed the landscape of economics for Japan and, you know, all over the world. Like, you know, over in the past, like, three years after that, like, by 2010-2011, like, I, I was hearing from CEOs in Japan that sales had declined by about a third and they weren't recovering. So if you think about it, like, you know, every company just lost about a third of their revenue. And most companies don't have 30% of margin to give away for free and still operate, right? So, like, it's bad. Like, you are seeing companies close. You're seeing things like brands, like, cut back. Um, and a lot of these, because you have to remember, like, these games are relatively cheap to make, which means that your budget is not that big. We're talking, you know, $100,000 U.S. cash, you can get a game out. You can get probably two games out too, if you depending on how you spend it. Uh, but, but that means that to break even, you're only earning hundred, maybe two hundred thousand dollars US back. That's not that much margin to pay your costs and your, you know, pay a living wage to all your workers, right? Um, so you see that a lot of experimental titles, like a lot of just things that people were creating, like they used to do okay because there was money in the system. Now they, you know, thirty percent sales down. Those aren't working out very well. Um, so you see this by over time, you know, on the right, you see a chart of saying, uh, of like, these are just total sales marked on Arrow Gamescape, which is just, I'm just using it as a metric for how many titles were released. The high point of all games was in 2012, it was like about 1500 games were like titles were logged into the system then. As of 2016, there was a 35% drop in just total titles, which is, you know, not it's indicative that there's something happening to the market, right? Like, um, there was a big run-up, and now it's been declining, and it seems to continue to decline. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in 2017. On top of all this economic thing, 2011, we had that giant earthquake that really, really hurt the economy of Japan. We have, have I've heard personally stories of, like, companies that were not in that earthquake zone, but in Tokyo or even, you know, in Osaka, where they had their servers just knocked over by the strength of that earthquake, and they lost work. Just, like, backups were destroyed. Like, an entire years of work was destroyed. You know, that's on top of all this other stuff happening. That's, you know, a significant financial blow. Some companies that make it out of this. And on top of all this stuff happening, which is specific, you know, to Japan's economy, you know, the smartphone becomes a ma major thing. Uh, we have a talk later on mobile, but like, yeah, like starting 2008 or so, you know, the iPhone really like takes hold. And, you know, Japan has always been like a very mobile, like mobile tech friendly country. But those, you know, flip phone things that they used to do didn't play games very well. Whereas now they had full screen 
things and mobile games are starting to become a thing, right? So that is also a very important factor in like a change in the market landscape. So currently now in Japan, roughly, there has been a sustained contraction of the market from all the things that I've been talking about, and that's put the industry on defensive, right? Like even some of the biggest brands had like shut down. Elf was, which was a brand like stemming from the 1980s and it's been like a pillar closed down recently, like in the last year or so. Like the um, um, Leaf Aqua Plus, which is also, you know, famous for Too Hard, Tawari Mono and all that, they got bought out by Toranoana, like a, sh like a dojin, like, like dojin shop group. Like, I, like now they're mostly doing like PS4 games because the console games are earning them more money. Like, and there's been consolidation all over, and it's going to continue. Like, if your brand is not strong enough to weather this storm, they will close down. Um, so it means that businesses can't afford to take risk with their titles relatively. Like, they have to release to make money. Like, you can't not release, right? You either, like, once you do that, you shut down. So you have to make releases, and you have to devote money to making these releases, but you, you're very scared of the survival of your company because one flop could totally ruin like your entire business. So they can't, they can't afford to take risk. So they do very safe ones. You hear this complaint a lot from fans nowadays that they all, like 99% of the games that come out of Japan like today look the same. They're very like cutesy and moe type games and that's really it. Um, very few people are willing to stick their neck out and do something that's really out there and crazy because they don't know what's going to do and they have to put dinner on the table. So what happens is, from that pressure, the creators have actually been turning to the dojin market for like an outlet of their creativity. I've heard that they're just like, yeah, at work, I have to draw this kind of stuff and I have to write this kind of story because we know that sells a certain certain amount and keeps my job, but it sucks. And they go back, go to comic -A and they start doing their own crazy thing because at least then they can just write whatever they want and there's relatively no consequences to that. Um, I've actually seen that there's been some innovation in pricing and content uh, in Japan, just like browsing what's been going on with prices. It used to be that there were three price points, a low, medium, and high at three, like about 24, 3,000 yen, around 6,000 yen, and around 9,000 yen. Those were like the three price points. Now, just browsing yesterday, there were I've seen price points as low as 2,000 yen, and I've seen price points going up as high as 20,000 yen. Um, it, it varies a lot based on how long the game is, what, how many routes there are, what kind of combination of pre-order goods there are. Um, it's, so they are experimenting. It's not like they're just totally retreated into the thing, but they are experimenting mostly with price, not so much like what the game is, which is very interesting. We've see, we're seeing more media mix strategies. Just last year, we saw actually, I think, two animations that were announced for games before the games actually released in Japan, right? So that's totally unheard of as, until 2016. So um, they are definitely experimenting with trying to make it so that having the show and the game out at the same time will hopefully boost sales. Um, and also, we're seeing the global market is becoming more attractive. Now that there are more localization companies, like between Sekai Project, Mango Gamer, just Digica now and a couple of actually a couple of Japanese companies doing it on their own. They're like looking at the Western market, particularly at Steam, but as an attractive alternative source of revenue because they can't get enough cash to stay afloat in Japan. Well, they have a backlog. They can get cash for their existing backlog with relatively little investment in the West. So this is all happening. Not all companies are looking at the West in the same way. Some are, some are not. Again, remember, I'm talking very broadly, but that's kind of the situation right now. Now, currently in the West, the situation is different. The Steam is, has been progressively more willing to accept visual novels, even ones with adult themes. The problem is that the limits are very hazy. The policy is not like clear cut. Um, they obviously have, like, they can't allow certain things just because, for example, PayPal explicitly says you cannot sell adult things with their things. So they, their hands are tied in some respects. So they can't do certain things, but they have been increasingly more willing to try new things. Um, their policy, as far as I can tell, is evolving and it will continue to evolve. So I, you know, as one, as one partner like, is able to do more things, 
other partners will be able to kind of say, oh, we want to just do that. Can we copy that, right? And so collectively as an industry, we're going to like see things improve on that front. But we, like, we still, no one knows where that boundary is. So we're still trying to figure that out. We are seeing that crowdfunding of entire titles and just assets is now a pretty viable strategy. Like, you know, groups with um, that have very little history but have at least something to show can collect a few thousand dollars, not, you know, usually not $15,000, not $50,000, but they can get like three, four, five, six thousand dollars to get their project out the door. Um, when this first started out, a lot of people were like, what is this? Why should we do this? But, so, but now it's become something that's common enough that people are willing, you know, if you present a good case, they're willing to try. Uh, it takes some of the risk, we, you know. Um, this will be a continuing thing because I know people have opinions about whether pe companies should or should not do this. But at the least, like it seems now a viable strategy to try and consider, right, and decide if it's good for you. Um, visual novels created outside of Japan are actually seeing some commercial success, and they're actually building their own fan bases, right? Like, if you think about it, like the, if I told you this like three years ago, most people would just give me this look. And I'm pretty sure you guys like understand what I'm talking about. It's just this is actually happening now. There are brands that are not in Japan at all, just created here, and they have followings. They have people who they have fans. They you know, and they're building success off of that. Um, all this is meaning that there is some limited commercial success in visual novels currently in the West, and that it's fueling you know further investment right because now that you know you guys are getting some money that means that you have money for the next thing which means you can buy better assets which means you can do more ambitious projects right like you know success breeds success so um, that's the situation here is I think it's looking up so you know there's opportunity hiding in this market that is facing all sorts of like pressures, right? Like the Japanese market, yeah, it's still struggling. The Western market, it's small, right? It's growing, but it's really small, relatively speaking. Um, another thing is that the pool of Japanese classic hits, like from the, the mid-2000s, like all those awesome games that, like, a lot of them are actually localized or in the process right now. If you, Like, that bucket is drying up. Um, so that means that there's going to be less competition from Japan for existing awesome titles. Like, you know, all, all the awesome ones, except for, like, say, Fate, has been, have been taken. So at this point, you're not going to have to worry about competing with the next Muvlove because Muvlove is already done. Um, and so, you know, um, despite all these issues of, you know, struggling markets and stuff, like, the industry still has to release titles. You guys have to release titles. Japan has to release titles because that's how capitalism works, right? You either release or you die. So it becomes that innovation is key. Next, like the next frontier for like VNs is going to be just renewed innovation, right? In the next five years or so, like the games, the top selling games in the next five years will not be something that you or I have heard about today. It's not going to be a historic title. It's going to be something new. I don't have any idea what country it's going to come from. At this point, it's pretty much just open in the air. The catch-up game is over. Like, like the West in, like, needs to catch up in terms of just like investment and technology and you know polish. But in terms of like, like, but there's not like there's not much. What is there left to catch up to? Right. The, like you, everyone's on the same playing field in terms of like we are making a new game, and it's got to perform in the market. Um, so it's going to be an age where we're back to the early 2000s where we're trying, everyone's experimenting and trying to figure it out because no one knows what formats are going to work, right? Like Japan, when we were, talk to Japan about um, making a new game or something, they're like, okay, what, what, what works in the West? What's popular? Should we be making ninja? Should we be making like, you know, all sorts of crazy things? No one knows. When we, have to, when we tell them that and they're, they kind of don't get it in the sense, because in Japan, you know what's going to work because they've had a 20, 25 year history of figuring it out. But no one knows what's gonna work here. Um, like, it could be a combination of things. There could actually be no formula, but who knows? But like that, what it means is that you guys have to figure this out as a collective industry. Um, we know the Western market just does not respond in the same way as a Japanese one. Um, like, and also people tell you they want, you know, X, but what they buy is entirely different. So who knows, right? Um, we also don't know what price points will work. I'll discuss more about this later, but it's very important to know that 
there's no pricing conventions. It's just people copying other people. And I feel like that should change. But first, like what I want to call out to you guys for this conference is that you guys should be experimenting, learning, and iterating. Like at the industry level, we should all be creative, right? No one, no one developer is going to be like, oh, I'm going to make, try all the things. I'm going to do a mobile thing that's 3D that, like, that does a bunch of other things. Like it's just not possible, right? But like one, like one developer here can do something in mobile. One developer over there can do something in VR. One could make something that's an automated game. One could be a really gritty story. One could be a really cutesy story, right? And collectively, we can see all of this, and we can see how it's doing. And if we talk to each other and learn from each other, right, we can collectively figure out, oh, hey, this kind of stuff is doing better. Or this, like people respond really well to this level of quality. Or this is not as important. Like this kind of stuff is important. And we should collectively learn all this stuff because otherwise we're going to be spending 10 years trying to figure this out when we can do this in three. So hopefully you guys will keep raising the quality bar by learning all this stuff. And uh, at the end, my advice is like it's better to release, right? see what's the reaction and learn from it than to endlessly delay and then you like, like become irrelevant because um, I've seen people, you know, sit on a project for four years. It was a really awesome project like, you know, two years ago, but by now it's not as relevant for whatever reason, like the, some, like maybe the artwork looks really dated or someone else has done the same thing already. Um, even though they started later, right? Like there's just that relevancy. So there, there's a very strong sense that you have to strike a good balance. Um, that's not easy, but that is a challenge that we're going to have to face. So my final word about pricing is that a lot of times we price by gut feel. I've done it myself. We shouldn't be doing this. We should not price by gut feel. <laughs> or, and we definitely should not just be like, everyone else is doing it here. And we, like, that's what I should do. We need to have confidence in the value that we are bringing to our audience and we should price accordingly. Like, if you feel that this game is worth $13, for because of play length and because of the amount of energy and things you've put into this, then you should price it at 13. You should not be like, oh, well, everyone putting it at 10, I'm just going to go follow everyone or else I won't. So you need to have that confidence because otherwise, like the, the in general, like the price of all games, including AAA titles like Final Fantasy and all that, they're going up, right? If you look, it, like you're no, like, you're not paying just sixty dollars for a game anymore. They're they're pushing very hard for the eighty dollar pre-order goods or um, limited editions or all this stuff. There's a reason for that, right? Even the AAA big companies are feeling the pressure of inflation, where a ten dollar game after cost and inflation is not gonna put dinner on the table. So, um, and you have to remember that mem like most people never buy games at full price. Some do, but not very many. Right, like if you put yourself at a low starting point of like seven dollars or something, when like what happens when you are going to give that thirty percent off sale or the fifty percent off sale? You're you're earning almost nothing, right? And you know, don't count on the long tail. Like you you will have there's so many new games out. You have essentially a finite number of people who will, who will buy your game, right? At any given price point, there will be a, like you will expect to get I don't know one thousand or ten thousand people who will buy it, and you know, if you want, like, after that, there will be so much competition that they're not going to see your game anymore. Um, so you have the price going, okay, I can't, I can't rely on re residual income from the next 10 years. I'm going to have to do this. So anyways, um, this is my talk, and I'm done. And I will do questions, and then after that, I think I have five minutes left to give to the next speaker. So yay. Thank you. All right, questions. Okay. Um, cool. Um, I'm, let me, I'm scrolling through the questions. There doesn't seem to be any new ones. Uh, and there's other stuff here. But otherwise, like I, we have five minutes, so Justin can get set up. Do you want me to give you pre like presentation mode now, or, or what? Or do you want me to wait? Um, yeah, you can give it to me now, and okay. uh, I'm going to take a couple minutes, but people can just look at a blank slide and confirm that at least we have that much. Okay. All right. So that's done. So I'm giving you presentation mode, so my screen's off now. But I can, I'm reading the chat, and uh, I'm, so I've got a, oh, someone commenting, like, can I comment on Sekai's new name? I don't, 
know anything about the new label right now. Like, um, it's just kind of a new thing we're trying. Um, yeah, you guys have to know that brands are different from companies, but perception is everything when you're marketing, right? And so it just gives us a new reset on uh, and a way for con people to consistently kind of follow, right? Because a brand will release similar stuff. So um, all I have to say really so far is that, you know, that's a new direction and we're trying stuff and, you know, follow it and see, see where it goes. It's going to be uh, a lot of testing along the way. Um, all right, let me, let me post the Discord chat um, again, just in case people are not. <laughs> um, so screenshot. So yeah, video, I'm recording video right now. My backup co-organizer is also reporting video right now. If nothing goes wrong with the technology, and it totally can, but fingers crossed that nothing goes wrong, we will post this eventually on YouTube. I will give the link to ticket holders first, and then after a couple of weeks, I will then make it market as public. Um, so hopefully it all works. But I really don't know. I really, really don't know. Purely random. Uh, felt hopeful about recent, e so if someone's asking, have, have I felt hopeful about any recent EVN titles? In general, I'm feeling hopeful that EVNs are gonna find their own place. Right now, they have, like no one, like again, like no one's figured out the formula. I, I speak as if there's one formula. Obviously, there's as many, but like we're like I'm. I want to encourage people to find to like be willing to try stuff out, right? Because imitate like imitating Japan is not going to work going into the future because the markets are so different but we don't know what's gonna work. And so my hope is I've seen create, a lot of creative stuff come out and I'm seeing people react to them. So I know that this is happening and I know it's gonna happen more in the future. So I feel hopeful in that regard. Um, comment on sales platforms outside of Steam. Um, honestly, as a developer, you should be working with as many sales platforms as possible as, you can, as you're able to manage. Right? There's, there's a mental cost to managing multiple uh, sales uh, platforms. And sometimes that's what having a publisher can help you with. But it doesn't hurt you to sell your game in more places, right? It's an, you can infinitely copy a game. Um, so you should just go for it. Uh, like Steam will always be the biggest one just because of how many users it has. But it's not the end of the world to do another thing, um, you know. Uh, and you should be wary of, you know, exclusive deals. Um, be, read your contracts, read your contracts, read your contracts. Um, da, 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 uh, do, you, do you think that part of it? Um, so someone's asking, do I think the reason that, part of the reason that VN production in, is shrinking in Japan is because it's oversaturated? Um, there is some oversaturation. Well, no, no, what I'm saying is companies are closing because the market can't support, financially support, that many brands, right? Um, so that's that 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 is a truth. Sales are down because people are getting pulled off into mobile games, right? Like you know, I can't count the number of friends who are being sucked into you know like Love Live or uh, or like IMAX, right? Um, also the web games, you know, Kanko and all that. Like those are dragging people's time, and time is just as valuable as money. And so um, when that when that happens. Um, that's why the VN market is shrinking, and like so, it is a pretty dire situation in that regard for them. And I hope that like you know, there's some strong brands will survive, but I don't know how far that will go. Um, so Astro is asking, you know, do I think v VNs will be mainstream as anime, and like how do I see it in ten years? Like I don't. That's hard. Becoming like, you know, like just from like having someone read a thing versus like having someone something play on TV and like the economies of scale and the, like the sheer industry behind that. I don't think it's going to be a thing, but like, look, like if you think about it, like, you know, the, the trucking simulator things had its own thing and it's a, you know, it obviously makes them a quite a bit of money. And like, I have never played it a bunch of people. That are, so like, there's no shame in being a niche thing. You can totally make a large amount of money 
in a niche thing. So like, it shouldn't be a question of should we be mainstream or not. It's just like, hey, can we find enough fans who love us enough to give us money? And I think that's totally doable. Uh, da, da, da. If a game like if a game buys sold naturally, do, like, do I think innovate? Uh, someone asking, do I think innovation is like a requirement, like, uh, for survival essentially? I'm so paraphrasing here. Like, would a game like if a game is not dramatically different from some previously thing, would it crash and burn? Like, I'm not saying that there should not be series. Like, if you find a thing that works for you, if you find a thing that fans of your like your fans resonate with, go ahead and just run like go all in on that. Like, that's your thing, right? Like, if you figured out that's where your storytelling process works in that situation, go for it, right? I'm not saying, which is why I'm saying we should experiment as an industry. Because if I told you to write a mystery, like, it will not, like, and you don't know how to write a mystery, it's going to suck. I don't care, like, how good you are at writing love stories, it's going to suck, right? So do what you're good at. Um, and I, I'm over time. So, Justin, you want to take over? <laughs>